Super. We are live on YouTube. Okay, we are live and it's five o'clock. <laughs> First of all, let me start, all right? Thank you, all of you, Diana, Fred, Stan, and David for accepting our invitation for to be here in our second climate talk about wine in a changing climate. Thank you also to everyone on the other side of the screen. I hope you are all well and safe in the middle of the thermal, turmoil we have all been through. And today we're going to be debating various topics around the carbon footprint of sustainable, organic and biodynamic viticulture. But before we dig in, and for those of you getting to know us for the first time, let me introduce the Porto Protocol Foundation to each of you. We were born out of the climate change leadership events that took place in 2018 and 2019 in Porto as a commitment made by its participants to do more for climate change. As we speak, we count on hundreds of members from across the world and across the wine value chain. And we are on a quest to build a network of change makers and climate solutions so we can lean on collaborative and collective action to better respond to climate change. So I hereby leave you an invitation. Do join us and share your solutions, your experiences and challenges with us. Uh, but moving forward to what has brought us here in the first place, today, as I mentioned earlier, we'll be debating the differences and similarities between the various types of viticulture and their carbon, carbon footprint. And before I pass on the word to David, our moderator for this debate, let me briefly introduce him and uh, our other speakers. So David Gimmerange, he is the head winemaker and technical director of brands such as Taylor's Floodgate Ports, Fonseca Croft, but most importantly, together with his colleague Antonio Magalhães, he was a pioneer in mountain viticulture, a work that started 28 years ago. This work was recognized in 2009 with the National Prize for a new model of sustainable viticulture. And moving on to Diana, Diana, Diana is actually bringing expertise from two different continents as she divides her time between France at Domaine du Jacques and Trianne and Snowden Vineyards in California. Fred is based in Austria and has been working with his father, Alfred, since uh, 88. And he took full control of his family's, family's estate in 97. He's a founding member of RESPECT, a certifying body for biodynamic viticulture in Austria. And in 2002, 2002 he was named winemaker of the year by Austria's, now you're gonna have to help me with this, uh, Fred Falstaff Wine Magazine, thank you. Stan is based on the other side of the Atlantic in California. He held a number of positions in different countries and companies before finding a home at Silverado Farming Company, where he's been since 2005 and is currently a partner and a vice president for viticulture. I hope I did a good job introducing all of you. I pass the word on to David and I wish you a great debate. We'll see each other at the end. Thank you all again for being here. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on uh, where you are at the moment. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, let's hope for some good uh, discussion and enlightenment to this topic, which uh, is of passion to all of us. I'd like to start with asking our panelists to share their experiences with a viticultural practice and their environmental impacts. So Stan, if I could start with you, in your work with sustainable, organic and biodynamic vineyards, at different locations, what are your main challenges for each form of viticulture? And if you had a choice, would you have a clear preference for any one of them? Um, that's a great question. Um, we currently farm 35 different vineyards, two are biodynamic, four are organic, and the rest of them fall somewhere in that spectrum of sustainability. Um, so for the sustainable vineyards, I'd say probably the really only challenge is what does sustainable really mean? And how do you measure how sustainable you are and how far you can push that, that program? You know, we all start in at a certain point and then we try to do a little bit more each year and, and there's no real end point. It's always a constant. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, Diana, some of our clients yes. will participate in quite sustainable 
Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. with organic, I would say that the hardest part right now is phosphorus fertilization in hillside vineyards that are with acidic soils. Mm -hmm. It can be done, it's just quite expensive. Um, and then weed management under the vine in organic. On flat ground, we have undervine cultivators. It's pretty easy. On hillsides, you're shoveling or you're weed eating, and it's labor intensive, it's expensive. Do you um, have standard personal preference? Honestly, my personal bias is towards organic. I think there's a large benefit from going from conventional to organic um, in many ways. And I think we can do it. It's sometimes a, a marketing question. You know, we have a lot of clients that are organic, but they don't really promote it in their, in their wine. Their, their main focus is wine quality and that's what drives it. Um, and whether or not they tell their organic story or not is really up to them, so. So that's my personal bias, and that's where I would like to see things go. And it is really, in Napa especially, that's sort of a growing trend. Sure, sure. Diana, at your Snowden Vineyards in, in California, you practice organic uh, viticulture, and at Domain Dujac, you are fully biodynamic. How do you find the differences between both of these practices? Um, well, I should say I'm actually in the situation that Stan described. I have a hillside uh, vineyards when we still don't have a form of phosphorus that has been working for us. We've tried three different products and that's the one thing that we're waiting um, waiting on to start certifying. But I do feel that when you, when you give up herbicides and you give up systemic fungicides, you're no longer changing the ecosystem of the soil. And so in that sense, um, in that sense, we, we are organic, but we don't have a organic source of phosphorus yet that's working for us. So that's my, my one disclaimer, but that is what we're, our goal, our goal is to get to, to organics and we're, we're close. So um, I have, I was actually, I'm from Napa and I moved to Burgundy after finishing studies at UC Davis in 2001. And when I started working with family who are my in-laws uh, in 2001, they were already starting with biodynamics. And when I started commuting back to California to work to, with my family, we transitioned almost, we were fully transitioned by 08 and we had gotten quite a significant proportion of our vineyards to biodynamics. And I would say that um, the biggest shift uh, is giving up herbicides and you can, any person can see the change in the soils the day you give up herbicides and there's just better soil structure, more moisture, more organic content. They just look more alive. And so um, that was that was what I really pushed my family to go towards towards organics um, because biogenics on top of it um, is just a, a extra costs as Stan was saying, extra passes on foot. And I, I, um, I love biodynamics and we're quite committed to it, but my family's um, finances just weren't there yet. So the first, first step is to have a healthy ecosystem in the soil. Excellent. Well, Fred, um, you took control of your family state back in 1997. And uh, now for quite a while in 2006, you began practicing biodynamic viticulture. So what were your main challenges in converting from your previous viticulture to biodynamic? And what do you see now, having passed quite a few years now, the biggest impact in your vineyards and the grapes that you produce? Uh, first of all, when you when you start doing biodynamic or when you when you think about changing, um, you don't see the challenges. You only see uh, a new way, um, which is fascinating and um, drives a lot of emotions. And the challenges, challenging things are coming a little later <laughs> when you see the first differences and the first problems in some difficult years, which we focused in seven and eight. So we started in six. Um, the biggest challenge in changing was uh, you need more, you need more power in a way. You need more um, um, manpower. You need more machine power. You have to spray, if possible, everything in a day. Uh, to to um, to have no infections in the, especially in the difficult times about blooming before and afterwards and uh, so that might be the, the biggest challenge and and what you see after a few years of working biodynamic is um, you see quite a quick reaction of the vineyards um, uh, not always positive uh, some vineyards are getting poorer and poorer and uh, you see really 
maybe you see really the soil life, what you have, or maybe you see also is other wines fitting to that soil you have and all that. And then some, some vineyards are starting really blooming and uh, you see a lighter green in a way. Mm -hmm. um, after years, you, you can find, I would say more balance in your vineyards. Uh, you don't have this hysteric growth which you see in many, many conventional farmed vineyards. Uh, so meaning too much growth, uh, too much green. Uh, you see a nice uh, difference between um, the, the phases of a year, spring, summer, autumn. Um, you see uh, changing the leaf color in autumn, which you don't see in conventional farmed vineyards so often. So I think um, it's much closer to, to the nature life at all. And you see a big difference in, uh, on the berries, on the grapes. Uh, they, they look different, they taste different. Uh, uh, yeah, so you really can see the difference between conventional farmed and biodynamic farmed vineyards. Is scale an issue? So um, if you have a very large area uh, with biodynamics, the attention and the exact moment of, of doing any action is critical. So um, would scale be an issue if you, if you practice by numbers for, for any of you? Yeah. As scale or uh, what do you mean? Well, if you have size. very large areas, size of vineyard, so. Mm -hmm. uh, sure, but, uh, but you, have to, you, you have to see it in, in, in smaller parts. You can manage it in, uh, as, uh, let's say, we, we do 80 hectares. And, uh, 80 hectares. and we do that in a very diverse uh, area. So my, my place has a lot of different soils, a lot of different microclimates. And you, it, it helps when you have experience about your area, of course. Uh, then you know there are some vineyards where they're focusing always on uh, mildew. Uh, others um, uh, have problems with growth. And uh, so you can react uh, on, on small parts in a bigger scale. And that's possible. You need, uh, the critical thing is manpower in a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'd like to move on to then uh, probably more focusing on the, the specific point of the carbon footprint of, of each type of viticulture. And, um, and Diana, some people claim that to run vineyards organically, you have to significantly increase the use of tractors to spray and to manage your weeds. And, uh, and therefore there's a more negative impact on your carbon uh, footprint from the increase of fuel use. How do you counterbalance this effect in your viticulture? Um, I, I certainly don't deny that you have to make more tractor passes and you're spraying for on foliage, foliage for mildew and you're making more passes on your tractor uh, to cultivate underneath with your plowing underneath the vine and you have to make more passes because when you use an herbicide you spray it one time and, um, and you're done for the year. But, uh, but on the other hand, in the meantime, you're killing a whole ecosystem that is really the bridge between the terroir, the, the soil that you're trying to express and the vine itself. And you're handicapping the vine from finding its own resources and defenses against all of the, the funguses that are attacking it. Because we now know that there is a symbiotic relationship between the mycorrhiza and the, the, the roots themselves. And if you are killing the earthworms through uh, glyphosate, and if you are pumping synthetic fungicides that they're going out through the roots, you're killing that whole ecosystem. So yes, you have to make more tractor passes, but I think you need to take a step back as a producer. I mean, here we're focusing on, on a very specific part of the whole production. We're focusing on how to farm. And as a producer, you have to take a step back. You're managing a lot of things for one thing managing the health of your employees. Glyphosate is terrible in terms of, now we have the, also the studies that prove in terms of um, cancer rates of people who are really in close contact with glyphosate and making those applications. Then you also have to, you have to think about wine quality and what I was just talking about really, um, especially from a Burgundian point of view where you're trying to express the vineyard, if you're killing all of those microflora, then you are handicapping your capacity to express terroir. So uh, you have to balance quite a lot. And I would concede that perhaps you have a higher carbon imprint at that point. Although I don't think that there's a really good calculation 
of the carbon imprint, uh, carbon footprint of the different in different farming methods because once you're killing all of that life, all of that life is sequestering CO2. So are those calculations taking into consideration the fact that you've killed the soil and are no longer absorbing CO2 out of the environment? Mm -hmm. Well, Stan, uh, you do manage a fair area of uh, sustainable. Um, I guess being able to have at hand uh, a, a small amount of pesticides and herbicides can, uh, can relieve that carbon footprint from the high use of mechanization. Um, again, that would you be willing to easily forfeit that? Well, to echo what Diana said, we've been really trying to do carbon budgets for some of our vineyards, and it's pretty interesting when you look at soil organic matter and how much carbon is sequestered in soil organic matter. So, yes, it's more tractor passes, but if you sort of do the math, if I can up the soil organic matter by half a percent or a percent, I, I greatly sequester much more carbon than I've expended by extending tractor passes. So I think we kind of have a math problem trying to figure out how to measure these things. Because I don't know that necessarily organic has a larger carbon footprint. I just don't think we know yet how to quite quantify all that. But I would love to be able to retain the ability to use a little bit of pesticide or a little bit of herbicide in some of these farming systems, specifically if when and if, well, when labor gets to be a, a problem and a shortage. You know, I can do weed control with shovels and a whole lot of people, but I have more back injuries that way and I just have to have more people and I don't always have that. So the flexibility to have a sort of a blended system where you have access to some agrochemicals when you really need them to offset labor problems or offset carbon issues is a valuable thing. Sure. And, and I guess we're all waiting out for an organic herbicide to, to come. We know there's some being working, worked on. So, yeah, they hmm. worked better this year when it was hot and dry, but now the rains are back, so they're kind of thin. But there's, there'll, there'll be things coming. Um, nice. We'll see. But I, I think overall, I'd love to have a better way to calculate. I can't really calculate the carbon footprint of an herbicide because I didn't produce the herbicide. So I don't know what went into the production of it, the packaging of it, the transport of it. So. Hmm to put my finger on the exact carbon footprint of an herbicide versus undermine cultivation, I can't do it yet, but someday I'd like to. For me, an organic herbicide is an oxymoron that is an impossible uh, thing to consider. <laughs> you're, you're impacting the ecosystem of the soil, whether it's organic or not. Sure, yeah. sure. That's right. <laughs> and, and Fred, I know um, when we talk about the carbon footprint, we all think about CO2, but uh, uh, people don't talk probably enough about nitrous oxide, which is released from chemical fertilizers. And nitrous oxide is 294 times more damaging than CO2. And uh, in biodynamic and inorganic viticulture, by not using chemical fertilizers, you greatly reduce the carbon footprint uh, from just that point alone. How do you balance the nutrition of your vines without using these chemical fertilizers? Yeah, I would say, first of all, uh, biodynamic is an, a holistic system and a few things like herbicides are no-goes. Uh, we don't discuss that because we, are, we try to deal with nature and not to manipulate nature. And uh, that's the, the big difference. And biodynamic is a holistic system and farm individuality. So producing everything what you need, taking your resources, what you have for producing something is one of the main concepts of biodynamic farming. And uh, yeah, to, to balance growth and balancing is everything in biodynamic farming. Uh, balancing the growth means um, reacting on your soil. And what we are doing is we, we do composting and we do composting with our own materials. So what we get around uh, the surrounding areas, so the bushes, so the wood get chipped uh, we try to get manure from uh, stables, from cows and, and uh, horses. Uh, we use our pumice and we try to make a very proper uh, compost and uh, very high quality if possible. And with that, which we changed two years now ago, uh, we, we're not using too much material because that's again, um, a lot of um, machine use land because when you you know when, when you have 80 hectares and when you want to do 10 or 15 tons per hectare you need just a quantity for that uh, so we changed that system to uh, compost tea 
try to get very, very high quality compost, make compost tea out of that, and try to get a very nice green cover management um, with, um, where we get enough uh, organic material. And this with uh, compost tea creates uh, a very nice, um, yeah, reacting of, of uh, or activating of the soil life. And this helps to, to feed the wines at the end. Uh, so we, we try to take it very serious what we have and uh, to save what we have and try to work with the resources what we have uh, because that's, that's, that's for sure the main concept of biodynamic. And of course, we accept sometimes that growth is not in that perfect conditions what you might will see. Uh, but that's again nature. So we, we, we are not measuring uh, and then we add something what we need. So we, it's more um, a feeling looking outside and then reacting of what we see. Sure. And, and uh, obviously you know, we're talking about um, covers, grass covers, biodiversity. And, and Stan, uh, in, in California in particular, we talk about sustainable viticulture there's more of a trend to, uh, to practice leaving areas of natural vegetation uh, in between vineyard blocks to promote harboring insects and, and create areas of, of greater biodiversity. Do you see this tendency growing uh, amongst the farmers who you work with and how important do you consider this to be? I think it's important. Um, I see a lot more discussion in the farmers I work with. I don't, I haven't seen a lot of implementation yet. And so I think I really need to push that agenda a bit harder. We have a lot of resources available through our state extension and through um, USDA and things like that to do a hedgerow of, of native shrubs that bloom throughout the year and provide nectar resources for beneficial insects and, and all those things. It's all possible, it's all there. Uh, the challenges are finding enough appropriate space around your vineyard if you have it. We tend to plant as much as we can plant in Napa because the land is so expensive. So it, convincing people to, to plant a little bit less and maybe give us some space um, to put in permanent stuff is, I think, quite valuable for uh, leaf upper control and, and all pest control. And also all those woody plants sequester carbon and that will help with the carbon budget. So I'm gonna work on pushing a little bit harder. But the resources are there and the information is there. Yes, well, uh, I think we talk about value or price of land. I think Burgundy probably beats the scale there. Uh, <laughs> vine planting in, in Burgundy uh, occupies every bit of available land. Uh, Diana, how do you promote uh, biodiversity in your vineyards? Well, um, yeah, no, I think it's very important. And uh, you, you have to remember that Burgundy is a very fine thumbnail along the crest along the one side of the valley. So you have forest right above and then in the flats you have you have other uh, agricultural products. You have wheat and you have um, sunflower and other things. Uh, we, but, but that's probably not diverse enough. Um, we have tried to keep the, the fruit trees that we have from place to place, but certainly my husband has said that since his youth, there are fewer and fewer of those kinds of things. But recently we were able to acquire a small bit of extra Moray village, which is planted to a walnut tree and two cherry trees. And we're keeping it that way, even though both of the neighbors on that parcel are, they're not our neighboring our vineyards and they're both somewhat exasperated with the roots of the oak tree going in and competing with their vines. But I mean, really, that's all you can do. I, the, the idea that you would tear out Grand Cru and put in a shrub is now out of the question. Um, but I think protecting forest is something you can do. Torres, Torres in Spain, they have for, um, for all of their vineyards, they have some factor uh, that they buy and protect forest. So 10 times the surface area of forest. And certainly my family in California, we have 170 acres and only 25 are planted and the rest we have obstinately kept as forest, even though it is financially punishing. So I think there's always something you can do with, with that respect um, once you feel that it's worth it financially. And I guess Fred, you were mentioning that your 80 hectares is actually distributed across different parts of the region. So that's a- Sorry, a what was, were we talking? No, that, that, was, that was Fred, sorry. Yes, I was, I was saying Fred oh, exactly. Sorry. But you, you might have a similar situation in Burgundy or maybe less so. 
um, you know, the land is not that expensive as in Burgundy, so it's uh, easier for us to create uh, areas where we get our biodiversity um, places. Uh, we, we have we have a little we have a sentence in our guidelines that respect uh, that says every win vineyard should have a tree. Uh, this is a kind of metaphor for that, but um, we, 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 we take it as it, uh, it's written. So most of the members take that very serious to create area where you can uh, create diversity, biodiversity for your vineyards. But also diversity in the vineyard is important. So the green cover, you can do quite a lot of that. Uh, so we seed, for example, each fourth row, which we let blooming over the season. Um, and uh, that, yeah, that attracts a lot of insects and life. Sure, sure. Um, in, in terms of uh, vine vigor, and um, uh, when we're talking about uh, disease management, when you have um, less vigorous uh, vines which which tends to happen in organic and uh, biodynamic vineyards there's certainly a factor that uh, makes it easier to control your de uh, diseases and your your particularly your fungal diseases and uh, what's your experience there across your different plots fred uh yeah balancing balancing the growth helps a lot and uh, but it's a it's a dangerous play in a way because when you have uh, too much um, you see more problems with diseases. Maybe you see greenness at the end in the wine, which, you're, which I don't like. Uh, but to have uh, uh, too, too less growth, you have stress. Um, that can mean that you have um, not really big troubles with uh, mildew, especially um, uh, downy mildew. But um, then you can have maybe bitterness in the wines, and, and you also don't want to have. So balance, balancing the growth is more or less our work in a way. So that's the, that's the trick in a way to, to keep the wines healthy and to get a good wine at the end. Very much so. Um, so I'd be, like to move back to uh, this issue of sustainable viticulture and uh, particularly the discussion around the global standard. Should there be a global standard for sustainable viticulture? And um, uh, there is, uh, for organic, biodynamic, the standards globally are much more um, consistent, much more equal. But uh, in sustainable, there aren't really rules which guide people in every country. How's, how do you see that? Um, it's, well, it's even regional in our country. So I currently have five different organizations that will do sustainable certification for us. Um, they're all quite similar. There's a little bit of differences. Which one do we do? I don't know. Um, or do we do none of them? I think if you're going to use the word sustainable in marketing and in sales and promoting the general public, then I think there should be a standard. And I'd love to see an international standard. I, I'm a little skeptical we can get there, but I guess it's possible. Um, but like I said, we're sort of in a confusing time. I mean, we almost have competing organizations right now in California um, doing certifying sustainable and the certification is not incredibly rigorous to be honest it's a lot of voluntary maneuvers and poorly defined things um, so i think there's an opportunity to improve that and an opportunity to to get a standard if you're going to use that word the other side of the coin is i often get a little frustrated and say look i'm going to farm the right way and do the right thing and i don't i don't know if i need your your certification or if i need your approval um, but then that's harder to explain to the consumer, harder to explain to the public. So I think having yeah, a standard would be good. Sure. And Diana, does, does this frustrate you, this uh, um, lack of uh, clarity when, when you're with your biodynamic, you're organic, you're working very hard to, to comply? Um, do you see that being very lax? No, I, I honestly, I only have a certain amount of um, creative spirit at any one moment and I'll let everyone make the choices that works for them. I know that I, yeah, I, I won't be using chemicals with my staff, with my vineyards, with my wines and uh, I'll let everyone make their own choices. So Fred, is it necessary to certify? Do you need the paperwork 
or is it something you should just do if you believe in it? Uh, first of all, you should believe in it. <laughs> so that, that, that's uh, that's the base of everything. But um, at the very end, especially for the consumers, yes, you need certification, especially because you need, I think, fair conditions on the market. There are too many people who are saying, uh, I am almost organic or I'm very much in biodynamic, but I'm not interested in certification but because that's too much paperwork. Of course it is, but it need at the end, I think, uh, guidelines, not for the work at all, but as a consumer's right that when a consumer buys something where he gets something, um, he should be safe, that, that's really in, in the bottle. And when we started in, in 05 and 06, um, so the group, which um, was the base of respect at the end, uh, we all said, uh, we, we are very interested in what will change. How will the wine change? So we, we didn't think about sustainability. We didn't think, it was not a green thinking at the beginning. It was only the quality of the wine. What will change? Because we wanted to get a little bit more individuality to our wines. And, um, and so we, we said, we don't need certification, but we will work by dynamic. And we said that, and the journalist wrote that. And next day we had a letter of Demeter. And they said, when, you, when you're saying this, you should have, uh, and you have to have certification. Mm -hmm. At the beginning, we didn't understand that. Today, we understand that very much because so many, so many in that market are playing with that love to nature. And, um, and this is nothing. Sure. And uh, so certification, I would say at the moment is important. Maybe in 50 years, everyone is working biodynamic and then that's not possible. Uh, that's not necessary then. Mm -hmm. I'd like to move, it, move over to a, a different uh, topic a bit, which is something which I think is going to affect each one of you quite differently. Fred, you're from the old world. Stan, you're from the new world. And Dana, you've got a foot in both which is irrigation and should irrigation be an acceptable practice for sustainable organic biodynamic viticulture. Certainly in the traditional old world regions, uh, by tradition, these vineyards are not irrigated. Irrigating vines has a negative impact on the carbon footprint, both because of the energy used to pump water, but also because of the greater release of nitrous oxide in more humid soils. So, Maybe uh, Diana will go for the diplomatic. You're in both worlds. Um, is vine irrigation a sustainable practice in viticulture? Uh, no, I think that I think it's not. And um, <clears throat> I would say that when I came on board with my family's property, we already had vineyards that were planted and established. And you can't start dry farming uh, on vines that are close spacing and are used to being irrigated. But that's certainly a personal goal. Um, but, you know, unlike Burgundy, where we can get rain, at, on the, the average is every 12 days. And in the U.S., perhaps like Porto or in California, you go months without it, six months, eight months without rain. And so you really, if you're going to go for dry farming, you have to start establishing the vineyards from the beginning on wide spacing with the right, with the right um, uh, rootstock. And, um, and so, yeah, no, that's, I... I we're not perfect. We're doing our best. We're trying to get there. But um, I would I would agree that it's not green and it's not sustainable. I mean, California has always been dry. The Native American Indians knew that before people moved in. And I would say that the planning that has been put in place for California is is is, is altogether unsustainable. And now we're starting to really feel it. Mm -hmm. Well, um, and you mentioned uh, down at the high density plantings, Fred. Uh, high, density, high density plantings in traditional old world vineyards allow for a, a low yield per vine, but a more reasonable yield per hectare. Um, but with the low vigor of biodynamic vineyards, are you occasionally tempted to, to irrigate or you don't see that as uh, something sustainable? Uh, irrigation is, of course, not really sustainable, but um, it's um, sometimes really the last helping hand uh, 
to get something, especially in a region as um, I'm working. Uh, so we had the last seven months, I think 150 liters, and uh, we had we have some some vineyards on terraces where you only find 30, 40 centimeters of brown soil on it, on 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 rock, and. And then we have Grüner Vitlina, which is a variety which needs food and water. So um, it's a compromise at the moment uh, to use irrigation in these vineyards. Uh, so in my area, there are around 10% under drop irrigation at the moment. Um, and we also have some drop irrigations, but it's not our goal what we want to uh, keep. Um, it's dry farming what we want to do, but this I think need time and maybe it need also the change of varieties and rootstocks in some in some vineyards and some soils. Um, it's not so easy, but you know at the end um, you need money for that and uh, and it need time to change. Uh, that's not so easy, and uh, it's also when you have a very good vineyard uh, with old wines, then it works in a way, but not always with Grunovetlina. That's one thing. And um, uh, but but of course it's not really it's not really sustainable and it has nothing to do with biodynamic in a way because uh, as I told you farm individuality is um, is the, the main concept of biodynamic and uh, pumping water from somewhere is not really uh, a resource from your farm. Well, um, I think uh, standing in the new world where. Um, the, the history of viticulture is not as old. There, uh, initially, there was certainly a tendency to choose the, the grape variety for the style of wine that you wanted and not necessarily select the grape variety that does well for uh, where you're going to be planting. And, uh, and Fred mentioned it, choice of grape variety, choice of rootstock and site selection. Um, surely... Uh, must be the way the world should be progressing to in order to reduce its need to irrigate the vineyards. Um, yeah, I agree. We do routinely look at, at soil and when you make a vineyard plan and choose the appropriate rootstock. Unfortunately, the variety is often driven by market conditions and what will sell and what people want. Um, we are seeing a trend in Napa on a few vineyards where we've gone into redevelop and they've said, hey, let's, let's take an acre and plant it on St. George and dry farm it. Um, and we're trying that and it's working pretty well. We do put in the drip system to establish the vines. It's there if we need it. But the question then becomes how often do you need to irrigate? Um, and there was a growing interest It first started. It's not from a climate standpoint uh, because I'm not sure everyone understands that piece yet. It was more from a California drought situation and knowing that water would be in short supply and how do we figure out how to grow great wines without using much water or using less. So it is a growing interest. Um, we're really just going back to sort of the, the techniques of our grandfathers more than we are inventing something new, um, but we're starting to look at those things again. So yeah, you'll, you'll see it, you'll see more of it. Yes, and in some countries, I know Australia has been looking at uh, uh, Southern European grape varieties, which are naturally more drought resistant and and even incorporating into some of the styles of wines that they produce. So, so we do have tools uh, at hand, but, but Fred, you're right. These things take time, uh, they take money, but, uh, but I think it, it's uh, probably something that should be in our mindset because uh, um, I normally say that irrigation is normally giving up on viticulture rather than using viticulture to try and find your solutions uh, to, to what you have. And, uh, and, and, uh, and Danny, having been, or being in the new world and old world, you certainly learn a lot from uh, what each, <clears throat> each part of the world is doing. Yeah, I think, I think irrigation is not so much a quality issue. I mean, it is, you, you, you know, if you're in a drought situation, even Burgundy will see harder tannins, but still you'll, 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 you can make great wines. It's for me, I think it's much more a yield issue and a financial issue. I, I work. I do work with some vineyards that are dry farmed in California on St. George. St. George already a low yielding, a low yielding rootstock, and then on top of that, if you're not irrigating, you're going to have tiny berries, and um, and so it's it's for, it's really financial. And I think frequently all choices ecological come down to financial choices, and um, and so you you know you can't be perfect everywhere, and you have to start picking and choosing. 
Um, so yeah, um, so in, in, in Burgundy, yes, we, you know, there are times when we have wanted rain and we've done a little rain dance hoping that it would come. And, you know, 2009, for example, we've had a lot of drought re years recently. Um, but we still, we still make great wine, you make a little bit less of it. Um, and, but the idea of changing that particular um, law, I, I think is, is also, it would, be, it would be a while before we start irrigating because you do see less vintage distinction as soon as you start adding water. And that's one of the things that we value is seeing both the expression of vineyard and the expression of vintage. Um, and that's really what Burgundy is about. So I, I don't see us making a, a change over to irrigation in sure. Burgundy and probably not, and not in most parts of France. And undoubtedly that magic word terroir can be yeah. questioned if you start interfering yeah. by abusing and the use of water. And, and as yeah. you said, one of um, the greatest attractions for the fine wine consumer is distinguishing between regions, between years, and uh, if we make everything the same or standard because we have the same viticulture or same climate, then uh, we're uh, more than likely to be going backwards. Mm. Okay. So we're doing, we're doing quite well here. So I'd probably uh, move on to a, a topic to give a bit more expression to each one of you individually to talk about uh, uh, your own experiences. And, uh, and, and I'd like, uh, if you could, to probably give your view on uh, the measures that you have taken to offset the carbon footprint. And, and Fred, if I could start with you, um, uh, do you have any experience with electric tractors or, or horses or other um, different methods which you have uh, actually promoting to, to, to reduce your carbon footprint? Uh, to be honest, no experience with electric tractors. Uh, that might be a, quite a new technology and um, I haven't seen it so often in, in practice. Uh, I, I think the concept of tractors uh, at all is not uh, a concept of the future because it's, uh, it's in a way silly to use a four ton machine to drive a mower and, uh, and some small uh, light machines. Uh, so I think we, we should change the concept, concept at all. So, so I don't think an electric tractor with four tons is the right, uh, the right solution because then you uh, do again uh, uh, packing the, the soils and all that, uh, which also make damages at the end. Horse plowing is um, quite romantic and very much um, uh, used on pictures and we did it. Um, we, we did in 2007, first time, uh, one vineyard where we can't use a tractor there. And uh, so it's very interesting because uh, it was quite a, a poor soil vineyard uh, from a former owner who used to also herbicides and we did nothing except uh, horse plowing and mowing by hand. And uh, that, uh, after three years, you could see a lot of differences on the soil, but uh, you know, 80 hectares uh, with horse and to be quick in some, uh, with some works, it's not so easy, but you can learn from horses. That's the good thing because a 100 PS tractor um, drives through the soil whenever you have time. A horse is only doing it when the soil is right and uh, the soil conditions are perfect. And when you take that experience um, and then use a tractor, I think it's, it's also a way, a way to work with. Um, so let's see what's coming up, uh, but I, I hope for smaller, um, less weight machines uh, in, in uh, our work for mowing and, and also um, disturbing the, the herbs between the wines and all that um, instead of electric tractors. Mm -hmm. Have you seen any work being done with drones for spraying? Um, not yet, because, you know, I don't know if this is working for, for sulfur and kappa so very much. And especially we have to bring uh, the kappa really to the place where it's needed. It's not uh, a systemic fungicide uh, where you can use for sure easily drones. Um, I have no experience with that. Um, but I hope, I hope that will, that will come or maybe... 
maybe we have a chance uh, with in the future or in the, in the very future with other varieties. But one problem of changing varieties and all that, um, uh, the, the varieties get too strong on the market. So today the, the varieties are brand names um, and uh, though that's not so easy to change. It would be much easier when we would focus more on epilation because then we can um, easily change uh, varieties uh, which we are working with. Sure, sure. Um, Stan. Guys, can I ask you to answer to the questions of the chat? Sorry to interrupt. We have quite a few questions in our chat. Mm -hmm. Thank um, you. I'll see if I can catch them. One of uh, uh, the questions has been uh, the use of rainwater for irrigation collecting rainwater and, and that being a form of uh, uh, reducing your, your uh, impact of collecting the water. Um, we've had, and so I, I don't know if anybody's got any experience with that uh, in any of the vineyards you manage. We Catch use rainwater for our sprays, for all of our organic sprays. We collect it in all of our buildings and we use it for all of our vineyard sprays. Very good. That's it, that's in Burgundy. Mm -hmm. Stand in the, the vineyards you work with, got catchment areas which have. Uh, yes, yeah. in some areas, a lot of we have is catchment, um, meaning it comes from subsurface drains that feed into a reservoir. We do have to then pump from the reservoir out into the vineyard, so there's a there's a use there. Some people offset that with photovoltaic solar panels to generate electricity. Um, there was also a this is a little off topic, but there was a chat question about tillage. And when you look at tillage and carbon sequestration and climate change, reducing tillage sequesters more carbon. So I can't really offset my, I don't have electric tractors yet, I don't have electric trucks that's coming, but I can change my tillage practices to sequester more carbon in the vineyard itself and try to address it from that direction. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's kind of what Porter is all about, do what you can. And so I'm, this year I'm doing less tillage because that's what I can do this year. And next year, if I get an electric truck, that would be great. Um, so yeah, we do use, we do use catchment and, and rainwater where we have it. Yeah. And there's no doubt that the, the topic of uh, sustainability takes us down many paths. And uh, you did mention earlier um, that there's the social sustainability, something which very often is overlooked. And, uh, and Fred, there's no doubt that uh, that the move to uh, uh, organic and biodynamic, probably the people who benefit most of the people who work in the vineyards themselves, um, probably before the environment or, or even the consumer themselves. And, and I, I certainly feel that's something that is very often overlooked. <laughs> yep, I guess you all agree. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, going to the no tillage question, I think that's one of the most interesting things happening these days in terms of carbon footprints. I have no experience with it yet myself, but I would like to do some trials. But I do think it's a trial that you have to try over many years because the first year you're going to be creating competition the vine is not used to. But when you telescope out, and I've, you know, I've been focusing on uh, climate change since the 2017 vintage in California, which I found really traumatic. I grew up in California and when, you know, I, I had never known a heat wave like we had that Labor Day weekend where it was 42 degrees Celsius in the canopy or, you know, 100, 120 in the canopy. Uh, we, I'd never lived through that in Napa. And that got my attention in a really concrete way. And since then I've been, I've been studying all of the potential ways a winery could have an impact. And what I think is most exciting is, is uh, without having any experience with the no-till, what I think is the most exciting is this idea of CO2 capture at the top of fermenting tanks. And uh, we have, you know, we have all of our hectare worth of vineyards in one place for a three week period and all of the carbon dioxide is coming out of that sugar in one place and you can capture it. And all we need is the technology and it's not me, we need um, chemical engineers to figure out how to, how to sink that CO2 into minerals. You know, seashells do it, chickens do it, it is doable, but someone needs to figure out how to do that. And um, we're rebuilding our winery and we have bought 25, uh, 30, 
$5,000 stainless steel tanks with plumbing so that I can evacuate CO2 from the top of the tank and I have a spot ready for the day that that technology is there and I can capture it and turn it to mineral and it's out of the equation forever. That technology is available. I have seen it at the Saragossa uh, Fair last year. Um, there is equipment uh, that has been developed which uh, siphons off the CO2 from the top fermentation tanks and compresses it. I believe yeah. that's something that Torres has been working on. Yeah, no, I, that, that exists. Then you're reusing it another way. What doesn't exist is the chemical pathway to convert it from CO2 to CaCO3, calcium carbonate. Sure. Uh, that doesn't exist yet. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Stan, I was wondering if you could uh, share with us the work that you have done uh, on the powdery mildew traps. Uh, powdery is a is a issue for a lot of us and uh, and that's quite innovative work you're doing there and and obviously if, if we can uh, develop forms of reducing having to apply or fewer sprays we will certainly gain benefits across all of our uh, um, footprint um currently we're looking at it as a way to reduce tractor passes to reduce fuel use to reduce um co2 production Frankly, there's other benefits also, but that's you know the current one we're looking at. It, this research all comes from Dr. Mahaffey out of Oregon, um, who did a lot of work on a little little pretty simple trap that traps spores, airborne spores in your vineyard, all spores. But we now have the lab ability to send that off to a lab, have them run the testing, and tell me, uh, do I have powdery mildew, and how much? What we don't yet know is exactly the numbers. So I get a spore trap that has ten spores. Is that a lot? I don't know. Thousand spores is a lot, but it does show. I'll give you an example. I don't have any spores showing up until this week. Um, I've already done two sprays this week, this year, for prevention of mildew, but I haven't had spores. So could I have not done those? Possibly. We're not sure yet how to use the technology, but we're working on it um, to use it to spray when we don't have spores, or maybe extend my spray intervals when I don't have a high spore count. Conversely, if I have a neighbor that has a lot of mildew and it's blowing into my vineyard, those traps pick it up and I can react to that. Um, so, so far I've reduced spraying by about 20%. Maybe I got lucky, I don't sure. <laughs> I'll try it again this year and see how it goes. Um, but it really all focuses around lowering the fuel use. There's a lot of other benefits from lowering the amount of fungicides we put out and all those things too. So it's an emerging technology the technology to detect it is great. We're just not quite sure how many traps per vineyard you need and how you use those numbers. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting work. And uh, and and uh, we hear quite often say you uh, you can save by not spraying when you shouldn't, when you should not, and uh, and spray at the right time, and that that can have uh, huge benefits and huge savings. So yeah. very much so. Um, Dana, you've been working with uh, the use of biomass uh, for energy production. I, I just looked into it. That one I did really crunch the numbers on. We haven't implemented it yet. Um, but essentially, yes, you can harvest your prunings. And it just so happens that uh, at seven kilometers from Domaine du Jacques, there is a place that combusts wood and turns it into electricity or, or hydrogen cells. And um, essentially, uh, it would cost four times uh, what we pay for, for our, our gas to heat our buildings to use the cuttings from our own vineyard. So again, you have a choice. Um, we have not done that instead of, you know, Burgundy widely burns their cuttings and that's what we had been doing. We stopped doing that. We're now uh, chipping them and composting them rather than trying to get them out, which would effectively be a second harvest. I mean, it's, again, it's about man manpower, collecting all those cuttings, driving them out. And, and, then, and then, yes, you could turn them into electricity and then um, it's, it's, it's renewable. Mm -hmm. yeah. yes, and, and certainly the, the cost of uh, transport of biomass, which has got very large volume and, and low weight. Uh, yeah, we, so essentially you need one truck per hectare. And fortunately, because of the location of this place, uh, it's not a very long drive. So uh, Burgundy is now looking into a pickup station for every city where you can move, put your cuttings into, um, into dumpsters and, and they do the rest. Sure. Uh, but, but Diana, would it be better to make compost out of that? 
Uh, yeah, that's what we're doing now, but we're doing it in the vineyard, essentially. We're chipping it and letting it compost in the vineyard. Essentially, you get to use that, that carbon twice. If you, if you combust it, you're heating the building with it. If you, if you just leave it to compost, well, then it's going out into the atmosphere and adding to, to your um, greenhouse gases. So if, if, you, if you combust it, you get to use it one more time before it goes back into the atmosphere uh, to contrib contributing to greenhouse gases. Okay. Yeah. Not for sure. Um, I'm just trying to see a question here from, uh, from the panel. And uh, there's one question uh, asking whether sustainability programs adequately address issues of ammonium sulfite and carbon costs of manufacturing fertilizer. Um, I guess, Stan, this is also what we said earlier, is, is uh, uh, accounting what the, the true uh, cost is, is there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, yeah, the sustainability, the sustainability programs will address, are you doing soil or petiole analysis to determine if your vineyard even needs nitrogen, because in many cases you don't even need it, and then what is your source of nitrogen? So specifically to the question of ammonium sulfate or any synthetic fertilizer. I don't know that they, they delve into the real carbon footprint of those, um, but it kind of goes back to what I was talking about before. I don't have the data from the manufacturer to figure out what went into the production of it. We do, we do believe or know that synthetic fertilizers are, have a higher carbon footprint than say if you use compost or manure. Um, and they're often a short-term solution to a, a larger systemic issue you have. So looking at long-term soil health and the nutrients in your soil and the microbes in your soil and how that's all cycling and getting, getting onto a more long-term approach rather than a short-term fix of ammonium sulfate is, is something the sustainability programs look at. But remember, they're also a very, very much of a spectrum thing. So if I look at my nitrogen and say I'm using ammonium sulfate, my goal is to use less over the time. And, and it's, uh, it's fluid and it's not, there's really no enforcement. If I, if I still use it, I'm not gonna get decertified. So that's, I think, where consumers have a little bit of confusion about what those certifications are gonna need. Okay, well, I think uh, we are pretty much used up our hour. And uh, I'd like to thank from my uh, side, the participation of the different panelists. Uh, I know we've, uh, we've covered uh, a number of different topics. Um, it's nice to see that we haven't got into any any disagreement between us but i think we're talking about all people who've got a, a a passion for what we do the environment that we work with inevitably the different regions the different businesses that we have might lead us to to take different options between sustainable organic or biodynamic i think deep down and i know for myself the pull is always to go as far as we can to to biodynamic whether we have the resources or ability to do so may not always um, uh, let us do it. But um, certainly I think we're all in agreement that uh, there is always a lot that can be done. And uh, with the common goal at the end, which is to produce the best quality wine possible and also being privileged in managing vineyards, we can also contribute to a very positive uh, environment that we, we work and live in. So I don't know if anybody would like to um, uh, say a closing comment and we can uh, go around. Ladies first, Anna. Sure, yes, um, I mean, we were asked to come up with one solid concrete thing that any listener could uh, apply so that we feel empowered and that we can actually face the problem of climate change. And I certainly struggled with this myself. It's very depressing when you really dig into the numbers. And I would say that one thing that I was just not expecting is you can really look at um, your bank. Uh, we're gonna take out a huge loan to build this new green winery. And the extent to which the, the bank you bank with is invested in mm -hmm. green, green energy or fossil fuels has a big impact on whether fossil fuels can carry on with all of their activities. So I would, that would be my takeaway. Ask your bank how invested they are in, in renewable en energy and put pressure on them. And thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah. Fred, or Stan. Fred, would like to. Uh... Yeah, I think I think uh, farming at all has a big key in the hand of uh, doing something positive in uh, the climate change. Uh, 
uh, we have so many possibilities to farm it in a much better way as we do it at the moment. And uh, I think biodynamic with this concept of farm individuality is one of the biggest key we have to, to reduce all the impacts uh, from carbon to uh, all others uh, to, to make it better, uh, especially on that question of, of climate change. And it's only a question of, um, of guidelines in a way. Um, to, 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 bring, to bring farming to, to a better site without herbicides and insecticides and uh, all these fertilizers, the artificial fertilizers which we are using and which for sure are not good for soil and all other resources we are working with. Thank you very much. And Stan, final word from across the pond. Um, just real quick, you know, what was surprising to me when I delved into some of these um, carbon questions was there were things in the vineyard I could do quite easily and quite readily that had a very big impact. And I was surprised at the things that I didn't know. So to keep reading, to keep looking at other people's experiences and keep sharing our stories um, and realize that there are, like Diana said, there are things you can do right now in addition to planning for more things we can do in the future. Great, thank you very much. And Martha, over to you. Yes. All right, just getting in again. Thank you very much, all of you. I tried to, to wrap up with some of the things you said. I'll use your own words. Uh, Stan was saying that at the end of the day is a choice to farm in the right way. Um, in regards to, uh, to Diana and using your words that anything that kills the ecosystem or that hurts your farmers, your, uh, your wine, everything is, you're completely against it. And it was lovely to hear your passion. And also finishing with Fred that it, that is has to do with a sentence that has to do with nature. Sorry, I was looking at my notes. Uh, that has a lot to do with the way that biodynamics viticulture works, uh, because being a, a holistic system and you try to deal with nature and not manipulate nature. I think that's a wonderful sentence to finish with. Also, I think also as a, a note to self to put the protocol, looking into dry farming tillage. Um, and the CO2 capturing on top of fermentation tanks, these are solutions that we also will be looking to uh, also to share with our members. Yeah. So thank you very much. Let me tell you that next week we'll be here again. Next week we will be talking about nature-based solutions and technology uh, being used in both, uh, both ways, of course, to help uh, vineyards and wine production in, production in general. Uh, create a climate response. And we hope to see you here next week. David, thank you so much. Diana, Fred, Stan, thank you so much for joining us. We have a lot of questions from chat that we were not able to answer. Really sorry for that. I will be sending them to all of you. So your work does not finish here. Um, so we'll hopefully we'll be able to come up uh, and share these, uh, these uh, answers in our website. So we can satisfy the, all the people, all the participants that I thank in advance for listening to us. Thank you and see you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.